Thanks for joining us once again. I'm here in Washington, D.C. at something that's called the African American Civil War Museum. My friends and I often refer to it as something that's called the Buffalo Soldier Museum because it's one of the many exhibits inside this museum. And I'm a little bit excited to get here because I've been about to visit this museum for the last 20 years and have never made it here, but I've only gone by it about 200 times and I'm happy to at least have made it to it even if I somehow found that the one day that they're closed when online it says they're open. Today, uh, we're focused on something called China Tesla doing okay, VW destroyed at the same time. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Thanks once again for joining us. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're a repeat visitor, welcome back. We also want to thank our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the show, would like some better ideas on investing and trading, please join us on Patreon. So it is a Saturday, 9th of November, 2024. I'm in Washington, D.C. at something called uh, the African-American Civil War Museum. As you know, uh, upon the end of slavery, we entered something called Jim Crow, very similar but different name uh, that lasted for about 100 years. And hence, we're just here today. So. I wanted to do this show today because there's something very interesting happening. And I'm going to call it, for sake of argument, something called the reverse catfish. So we did a show about three years ago. And the show was focused on a concept that had been developed that's called the catfish process. So there's construction behind me. I think that I'm going to ease over to cut down the noise level. So what the catfish process is, is that we have uh, a process where the, um, there was a fisherman that was in, in Norway and the primary catch that he would catch is something called sardines. What they found was that the sardines fetched a higher price if they were alive versus deceased once they arrived at the port. One of the techniques that he developed was a catfish. If there was no catfish in the sardine pen, they would die. If there was a fat catfish in the pen, they would stay alive trying to get away from the catfish. And so, yes, some of them got eaten, but in general, it increased the value of the catch. So what we learned from this was that one of the sort of senior leadership of the Chinese government had determined the way to improve the chance of success of EV companies was to create the catfish concept in China when it comes to electric vehicles. So as you know, there probably were as many as 200 EV companies for a while in China. And then this number actually uh, dropped to someplace around 20 now and still declining someplace in that 10 to 15. In terms of major ones, there's probably only five or six, but there's still a number of them out there because the Chinese government was eager to move to electric vehicles. So. That was the stated objective when it came to the Tesla introduction to China. On the other side of the story, Tesla benefited a great deal from the financial resources provided by China to help them be successful. What happened is that had China not provided the capital to build the factory in Shanghai, Tesla would have gone bankrupt. That successfully happened that plant has been very successful. But there is a little caveat to it, which I call the reverse catfish process. And that is that 
Tesla brought a lot of new technology, new manufacturing techniques to its facilities in China. So what ended up happening is that Tesla built the facility and is now producing a lot of cars on a daily basis. I believe it's one every 30 seconds that comes out of that factory. And some are remaining, most are remaining within China, but they're being shipped throughout, you know, to other countries, Australia, all these other, Korea, etc. One of the caveats to what happened and why I call this reverse catfishing is that the Chinese government ended up uh, taking sort of the blueprints and everything Tesla was doing in its manufacturing facilities and sharing that with all of the other EV, EV manufacturers because their number one goal was job creation. So te Tesla likely created about 30,000 jobs and now we have all these other jobs at the other EV manufacturers that are, are attached to Tesla. So what next? Basically what happened is that this production was going and going well, but in the last year, year and a half, a new development has occurred, which is the manufacturers that copied Tesla's manufacturing techniques have now expanded to build EVs not only for and sold within the Chinese market, they've now started exporting those EVs all over, most notably to Europe as well as to Australia. And what this has done has been a disaster with those EVs arriving as much as 50% below the cost of Teslas and other EVs. It's basically started grabbing huge amounts of market share and actually resulted in, uh, you know, just, just the market. In, in the case of Europe, they've increased tariffs. The U.S. tariffs, I believe, are still 100%. And so we haven't seen a lot of Chinese EVs here as a result. So further, what we're focused on is the fact that there's a new problem that's popped up because of these EVs. As you know, there are about 17 moving parts within, let's say, the engine of an EV that includes, uh, obviously, the battery packs and then a number of the components that allow the car to be a car, let's say. So what this did is that China has had notoriously huge difficulties producing competitive vehicles uh, that were available. And as a result, we've been in a very, very bad uh, situation in terms of the EV version of Chinese vehicles have been spreading throughout the world and been huge competition for a lot of folks. The one company I chose to especially focus on today is Tesla seems to be doing okay still in China, despite the Chinese competition. But when it comes to VW, their EVs have not proven to be as software well done. Even if they look fine, etc., they've kind of struggled to gain adoption around the world, uh, obviously, especially in the United States and certainly in Europe. So you've probably heard that VW just announced uh, that they were, for the first time in 90 years, closing factories inside of Germany because of the lower cost that they had elsewhere. One of the marketplaces that VW has been strongest in the world is actually China. Its brands uh, have been well regarded and very successful in sales in China. But as China's made this transition to electric vehicles, it's been a disaster for VW. It's my belief that VW just arrived at what I'll call the fatal flaw, where they've kind of decided they're gonna go out of business. How? Well, because of all the problems they've had with software creation for all their vehicles, especially the EVs, they made the decision in sort of three waves. The first wave was 
try to do it themselves, the second wave create their own internal software company with 6,000 plus engineers that didn't work great and was very high cost. And then their final attempt at great software is to ship all of their software development to China. Now, that is a good idea because you lower cost, but it's kind of a bad idea because all of a sudden you now have a major competitor that's going to be driving uh, a whole bunch of EV development uh, within the country. And so you end up competing with yourself, but you actually have to pay for that software development. So unfortunately, I think uh, this could be the demise of the company. I hope it's not the case, but I do believe that's kind of where we're headed. So I wanted to uh, mention this today because one of the biggest places that I worry about the industry of auto in is Germany. Half of their GDP is dependent upon automobiles and auto suppliers. So by not having uh, this uh, business of automotive uh, available, we now have a huge problem. Germany is the third largest economy in the world. It is the number one economy in Europe. As German companies start shutting factories, huge numbers of jobs are lost. The economy has already been in a recession for a year. And it's my belief that what VW is doing will jeopardize the longevity of the firm and will negatively impact it heavily over the next couple of years. So it's a very interesting case because this is why I call it reverse catfish. In this case, the small uh, fish that are supposed to be kept alive by the catfish are now in essence turning around to destroy the catfish. Tesla sales are affected but not dramatically down by this, but it's definitely affecting other large firms and their success within the company or the country. So I'm hopeful we can see some progress with this, but if we don't, don't be surprised if they and other German manufacturers who depend on the Chinese sales start to do very poorly and their stock price starts to drop. As you also may recall, we've had the issue of Dieselgate with VW and uh, the whole EV transition for them has just turned out to be a total disaster. And hopefully it's not a fatal disaster. So this ends our, so the conclusion is that G VW is in trouble. Tesla is not doing as well as it used to now that China's had a chance to copy all of its technology in the factories, but it's still doing well. And we have to say thank you to China because Tesla was gonna be allowed to go out of business by the US government and that did not occur. So we wanna thank you for taking time to join us in our conversation today. We next move on to our health tips. Just a reminder, your 20 leg lifts a day is a wise move. Also wanted to encourage you to remember uh, a, a uh, 25 leg lifts a day and to try to maintain a slim sleep schedule for at least two weeks to develop good sleeping etiquette that allows you to make uh, a healthy uh, sleeping etiquette for yourself. At any rate, this is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Tschüss, au revoir. La Heath Road, Washington, D.C., U Street. Uh, have a great day and bye for now.
Thanks for joining us for a quick show today. As you know, Tesla has now crossed $327 a share. Wow, up $30 today. So I had to, I was kind of shocked and wanted to uh, review some ideas that came across after some quick research. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Thanks once again for joining us. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're a repeat visitor, welcome back. We also want to thank our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the show, like some better ideas on investing and trading, please uh, join us. So as you know, uh, Tesla has been on a historic run for after the election from about 250 to now $327 a share. There is no doubt that there is a short squeeze going on right now. And the question is, number one, will the short squeeze, squeeze continue so you can make some money on the options in particular? I like those 330 calls uh, for today and then get rid of them by Monday, maybe two, Tuesday. The expiration date should be uh, a week from, fr from today is my suggestion. Number two, after you make your money, get out. Uh, you should get 50 to 100% on those. Uh, number three, um, as you know, during short squeezes, uh, the price of the stock is forced higher rather intensely for a short period of time, and then it will sort of uh, go the opposite direction after the full process of the short squeeze has occurred, which is what I think we're in now. The next thing I wanted to review is that there are a lot of people that have to realign portfolios relative to what's going to happen uh, post the Trump presidency start. And it's my sense that there's a lot of possibilities in how Elon slash Tesla slash SpaceX slash all the other companies he's working with might benefit from this transition. So one suggestion that was made today is that at a federal level, the FSD restrictions will probably be relaxed to allow Elon and company to do their thing. Will that happen? Uh, I would say so. Uh, that sounds like military bases, for example, might be a great place for Elon and Tesla to test out uh, these robo-taxis in real-world situations that are under federal control, not state control. The other area that I think is interesting here is when you look at the Cybertruck, one of the main entities that that vehicle is targeted at, particularly with probably heavy armor, is the military. So there aren't a lot of, you know, we, we did a show probably two years ago now relative to the Cybertruck. The thesis of the show is there's a huge problem, you know, the U.S. government has operations in about 350 locations across the globe. When you look at those places, they typically are running Humvees uh, in those places, but those are diesel or other or alternative fuel operating vehicles. And one of the problems is, particularly if it's a dangerous area, it's a lot better to operate off our solar panels because you don't have to risk the life of soldiers either in a helicopter or a heavy vehicle moving fuel on the ground. So don't be surprised if we see an emergency order for large numbers of cyber trucks, but perhaps a little bit more heavily armored than we've seen because of its functionality in places where gas stations aren't easy to access or fuel isn't easy to access. One of my uh, fascinating research points that I learned about with this is that the U.S. government in some cases spends as much as $1,000 a gallon in order to helicopter containers of fuel into, this was dangerous areas of Afghanistan and other places like it. So it's a lot cheaper to perhaps pick up a few cyber trucks, throw up some solar panels and power them from those panels instead of spending huge sums flying uh, fuel location to location is, is another way this could show up. The other way that the interface with Elon becomes valuable is clearly uh, the Starlink relationship as well as what they're doing with rockets. Right now, because Boeing is out of commission, 
you know, there are some smaller players, but he's almost got a monopoly when it comes to everything rocket, rocketry related. So until Bezos and company gets going, uh, they do have a monopoly and Starlink is, is in a power monopoly position as well. So my read is that the government business is almost at a monopoly as it is, so he can't do any more business with the government there. But when it comes to Tesla, there's a lot of opportunity to provide uh, the first sort of semi-trucks that are electric to the military forces domestically and abroad. There's also a lot of opportunity to provide cyber trucks, again, more heavily armored, so that uh, they can handle uh, heavier um, guns coming after them uh, in other places around the world. Um, where do I see the stopping in the short term for the stock price? I say someplace between 350 and 400 is the top end, I think, of this Tesla run. After that, I'm actually expecting it to pull back into approximately the 300 range um, because there's one little problem here. There are two primary reasons why the stock would go up and stay up. Number one is that um, you, you've increased earnings. Obviously, Tesla's doing well in that regard, and that's why the stock price was up. The second reason is you have a vehicle that's dramatically increased the number of sales. And when it comes to, you know, via, in, in the case of the Cybertruck, I'm focused on that because if the government decides to buy a number of those vehicles or expand their purchase activities, that results in uh, you have to go through the normal contracting process. And for standard electric vehicles, there's plenty of competition for different Teslas that would be part of the bid process that would come in. But when it comes to the Cybertruck, comparable vehicles, perhaps the Ford Lightning exists, but the problem is that there's not an armored version of that, as is the case with the Cybertruck, that would be competition. So I think the government slash the new president could justify buying a million Cybertrucks to add to uh, the force options and the Tesla stock would benefit dramatically from it. The final item that I wanted to point out here is that I actually had a good friend of mine who was an investor make the point to me that anytime you have a new president, it's often wise for your investment portfolio to identify what are the entities or companies that benefit from the new president. I have to say I'm a little confused on this one. And the reason is that prior to Elon joining a board, there was a plan to sort of cease anything with electric vehicles if he could, is what I heard. But now that Elon has come aboard, I think there's new light in terms of keeping the government subsidies, possibly increasing that. Uh, the reason why I'm surprised that uh, this relationship is working and will benefit Tesla is that the oil companies are very powerful and represent 25% of the market. So their ability to lobby, to have things representing their interests be more powerfully felt by the country typically is the case, not unlike what happened during the Bush administration because Mr. Cheney had been the head of Halliburton. So right now, there's a little bit of an unknown zone, but clearly Tesla will benefit particularly if Elon is in D.C. working for the government. But we look forward to seeing how all this plays out. But in the interim, uh, we're hoping that you're able to make a little money off of some calls at 3.30 with it hitting that, you know, 3.40 to 3.50 in the next couple of uh, business days. We're going to further have some analysis that results in us seeing what the biggest number is going to be as uh, we have some more analyst reports coming in on this. But congratulations for those of you who hold the shares and that are making good money in the process. Once again, thanks for the time. And tschüss, au revoir, la hitro, hoda hafez. Don't forget your 25 leg lifts and your 20-minute walk daily. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye for now.